Hello, everybody, and welcome to this conversation we've convened around artist Ryan Tabet's exhibition, Exquisite Corpse. Uh, my name is Ryan Inoue, and I am senior curator at Sharjah Art Foundation and curator of this exhibition, which is currently on view in galleries one, two, and three in Sharjah Art Foundation's Al Malaysia Art Spaces. If you're in the UAE or planning to visit, please see the show before it closes on June 15th. Uh, for today's conversation, I'm honored to be joined by the artist Ryan Tabet. Also joining us is Omar Dawashi, Associate Professor of Anthropology at Rutgers University uh, in New Brunswick, United States. Uzma Rizvi, Associate Professor of Anthropology and Urban Studies at Pratt Institute, New York, and visiting professor at Shah Abdul Latif University in Kaipur, Pakistan, and Andrea Wallace, senior lecturer in law at University of Exeter in, in the United Kingdom. In the interest of time, I won't read their full bios, uh, but these can be accessed on the Sharjah Art Foundation website. As the last session of March meeting 2021, this conversation builds on the past 10 days of thought provoking presentations and discussions, um, which have been spearheaded by SAF director and Sharjah Barnial 15 curator, Hur al Qasmi, alongside the Sharjah Barnial 15 working group, and have been overseen by SAF, uh, SAF's vice president, Noor al Qasmi, and director of learning and research, Noura al Muala, with their very capable team. A huge thank you to them for their support and for understanding the relevance of this conversation within the context of this year's March meeting. Exquisite Corpse is the first major institutional presentation in the Middle East of Ryan Tabet's ongoing project, Fragments. In 2016, Ryan began, Ryan began research uh, in earnest on the project when he began looking into details of his great grandfather's involvement in an archeological excavation led by German diplomat Baron Max von Oppenheim at Tel Halaf in Northeast Syria at the turn of the 20th century. Since then, Fragments has, presented, has been presented widely and in encyclopedic and uh, contemporary art institutions. With each presentation, the works reveal something different about the social and political fabric of the place in which they're shown. For example, at Kunstrein in Hamburg, the, uh, the exhibition of fragments drew attention to von Oppenheim's familial banking lineage, as well as his privileged role as a German diplomat and amateur archaeologist with dubious intentions. Uh, at the Louvre in Paris and Carida in Nîmes, these presentations in France recalled the French and British mandate systems that divided much of the Middle East. At the, Metro at the Metropolitan Museum in New York, we learn of the Encyclopedic Museum's acquisition of four Telhalaf orthostats via, via the Alien Property Custodian Act uh, passed during World War II. This granted the US government powers to confiscate and sell enemy property on its shores. When Ryan and I began to think about a Sharjah presentation of fragments, uh, we wanted to foreground its personal dimensions, but also firmly place it in the present. We not only wanted to critique Western imperialist violence and exploitation across the region, but also engage with its afterlife in nuanced ways. We wanted the exhibition to be generative and to introduce different concepts that resonated with fragmentation as idea, as evidence, as a theoretical proposition uh, that emerged from the region's historical context and material heritage, but had wider applications as well. This also invite, uh, we also, or this led us, sorry, this led us to engage Omar, Uzma, Uzma and Andrea as discussants as we developed the exhibition. We also invited them to contribute a piece of writing to the exhibition's forthcoming publication. Uh, in terms of the structure for today's conversation, uh, Ryan will follow up with an overview of fragments. Then we'll have brief presentations by Uzma, Andrea, and Omar. And we will conclude with a short uh, conversation among, pan among the panelists before opening it up to a Q&A. Um, just some housekeeping. As a reminder to everyone tuning in, simultaneous Arabic translation is uh, available in the box at the right side of your screen. 
The audience may share questions via the online chat function throughout the session, uh, and we will try to reserve the final 15 minutes uh, for a Q and A. This uh, the the session is one of the is on the shorter side, so we have one hour and 15 minutes. Uh, so we will try to field as many questions as possible, but prioritize those uh, that are relevant to the discussion. And I think with that, I will hand it over to uh, Ryan to discuss uh, fragments. Thank you, Ryan, for the this panel, the convening for the show, and thank you for uh, Omar, Andrea, and Uzma for. Uh, coming on this journey um, with us. Um, so Fragments is a project that I began in 2016, uh, but it's actually a story that began um, a long time ago when I was a kid. I used to um, have lunch at my grandparents' house um, every weekend. And I was always struck by the portrait of a, a, a very serious man hanging on the wall of their dining room that did not look like any one of us. And a book in their library written in German, a language that none of us spoke. And years later, um, when I went back to help my parents em empty my grandparents' ap uh, apartment, I found um, correspondence and photographs uh, linking my great-grandfather Faik Burkhosh to this mysterious man hanging, uh, whose photos were hanging on the wall in the dining room called Max von Oppenheim. And um, I was intrigued by, uh, by this material, but didn't know much about it. So in 2016, when I was invited to uh, partake in the DAAD Artists in Berlin residency program and uh, move to Berlin for a year, I thought that, you know, this is a German person, I'm going to Germany, maybe this would be a good place to start. Um, and very soon after, I found myself um, uh, falling into the story of Max von Oppenheim and his dig at Tel Halaf in northeast uh, Syria on the border between Syria and Turkey today. Um, and this project is, um, it's important to note that um, from the get-go it's a project that kind of grew as um, different chapters of it uh, were kind of written. There was no kind of prescription to the project. It kind of adapted to the people that I would meet, the institutions that were interested in kind of coming on this journey with me. And so in a way it's fragmented uh, even in its inception. Um, next slide, please. Um, so one of the major, um, and, and again, in, we have to remember in 2016, there was a lot of conversation around the preservation of cultural heritage, particularly uh, what was going on um, with the civil war in Syria. And I felt that the discourse around um, preservation was still very much caught in an East-West divide. The rhetoric that Western institutions are safe, uh, safer for the keeping of archeological artifacts, but also questions around restitution and repatriation were coming to the forefront. And I was really interested in maybe addressing some of these issues, but by focusing on a very specific um, dig, but maybe even a very specific set of, of objects. And, and the, the dig at Tal Halaf proved to be a very kind of fruitful one because it's full of contra contradictions and controversies. So basically in the late 19th century, uh, uh, Max von Oppenheim was um, uh, assigned by the German authorities to look for a viable road that would connect uh, uh, Baghdad to Berlin. And so on his way, uh, doing kind of sightseeing, he stopped at the village of Tal Halaf to spend the night. And that's when he was told of these um, gods and demons hiding underground. Um, curious about this kind of story, he uh, went to the site of this um, unlikely sighting. And very soon he discovered a few sculptures, but because of the change in um, uh, kind of political power back at the end of the 19th century, he was, uh, he returned back to Berlin and was only uh, able to 
come back to Tel Halaf in 1911. And so from 1911 to 1913, and then again from 1927 to 1929, Max von Oppenheim alongside a series of um, architects, photographers, uh, ethnographers, and uh, dig specialists uh, unearthed an entire um, city basically hidden under the plains of Tel Halaf. Uh, maybe the most famous um, uh, ex kind of part of the excavation was a palace um, that had uh, at the back of it a series of uh, 192 stone slabs, a frieze made out of them. Uh, soon after that, and by virtue of the um, transformation of the world following um, the First and then the Second World War. Uh, elements of this uh, frieze uh, found themselves at uh, the Louvre, the Metropolitan Museum, the Walters Museum, the British Museum, the Pergamon, the National Museum of Aleppo, and the Derezor Museum. Some have been lost or destroyed. And so when I, st I started basically this investigation by uh, getting in touch with all these institutions and asking if I could um, kind of be given access to uh, the material from Tel Halaf that they have in their collection. And one of the ways I was able to do that was to kind of ask or put in a request for making um, rubbings, which is a technique that archaeologists still use today in uh, kind of lifting texture out of objects. And so the idea was that this kind of single object that had been fragmented by way of the events of the, the socio-political events and the kind of uh, of the 20th century uh, would be maybe able to be brought back in some form uh, by way of rubbing. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so up until today, I was able to make 32 out of the 193, uh, 32 rubbings out of the 192 stone slabs. Um, uh, and those were from the Pergamon Museum, the Louvre, the Walters, and the Met, which were the institutions that accepted to um, uh, my requests. And I'm in conversation right now with the National Museum of Aleppo and the Derezor Museum to continue that uh, um, kind of that exercise. Next slide, please. One of the my major kind of interests in in the in this project was also to follow uh, this idea, as I said, of the maybe a reversal of the East West divide when it comes to uh, certain questions around cultural property. And what was particular in the the story of Tel Halaf is that most of the ruins that were discovered uh, by Max von Oppenheim were actually shipped to Berlin, where Max opened his own private museum called the Tel Halaf Museum. But during World War II, during one of the nightly bombings of the city, uh, the Tel Halaf Museum was targeted with a phosphorus bomb that burned everything that has been brought back, except most of the statues and architectural elements had been made out of basalt, a volcanic, a volcanic rock that could sustain heat. So, but when firefighters came to douse the flames, the sudden temperature change between the hot stone and the cold water shattered all the artifacts. Um, so years later, after Germany was unified, uh, Nadia Kolidis and Lutz Martin, two conservators at the Pergamon Museum, started a 10 year long process to put back together 27,000 of these basalt fragments. Um, after those 10 years, they were left with 1,000 unidentified basalt fragments that could not be put back together. And so when I got in touch with them and they told me the story, I was really moved, particularly by these one thousand unidentified fragments because I felt that they maybe could um, uh, not only are they witnesses to the event in 1943, but they bring the archaeological artifacts out of the 10th century BC into the present moment by way of, of this kind of special status that they now have. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I also kind of got an um, uh, I was allowed to make, uh, again, a stone uh, um, charcoal rubbings of every single one of these 1,000 uh, um, unidentified stone pieces, which is one of the works that's uh, on display at the 
Charge Art Foundation. And in this particular presentation, uh, we've kind of basically made it into like a full room installation, which for me again becomes maybe a moment of contemplation into the remains uh, of something that we might not know the source of, but can still be the beginning of, a, of an investigation or, or, or an idea. Next slide, please. Maybe the third and last kind of major collaboration with uh, uh, with the historical artifacts or the particular artifacts from Tel Halaf is another work that's on view in Sharjah, uh, uh, is basically one of the major pieces from the Tel Halaf dig is a kind of a grave marker, uh, which is a kind of the statue of a, of a seated figure um, that was made out of six and a half tons of, of black basalt. Uh, and it's also one of the pieces that was heavily damaged uh, uh, and then reconstructed. Uh, I was really kind of moved by the, the particularity of the sculpture. Next slide, please. The kind of its anthropomorphic qualities. And so I was kind of given access to the, to the original sculpture and I was able to make uh, these kind of foil pressings of uh, every aspect of the sculpture that made it human. So its ears, its nose, its hands, its eyes. Um, and especially because there's a, a um, there's contradiction around the gender of this particular sculpture. So even though Max von Oppenheim would call it it's his Venus, it's actually not really uh, male or female. But was also for me was very striking is uh, to think about the materiality of the sculpture, the basaltness of it. And while working on um, a proposal for showing this work in in Rotterdam, which was the first time it was shown, um, uh, I was able to got in touch and in touch with the last operating basalt quarry in Syria, which is in the city of Sueda, and order six and a half tons of black basalt to be quarried from this, uh, from this site. And the idea was that we would confront uh, part of the sculpture with maybe the original material where it would have been quarried from um, uh, you know, uh, at the time of the uh, of the dig itself, uh, because of the current uh, embargo uh, between uh, Europe and Syria, uh, the only way we could get the material out of Syria was to actually cut it into tiles, ship it to Beirut, change the uh, the records in Beirut, and then start its journey to Europe. And so this work has been shown uh, in Nîmes, in Beirut again, and now in Sharjah. Next slide please. So a big part of this piece is not only the basalt stones and the pieces on top of it, but actually the shipping documents that are integral to an understanding of this work that brings in this idea of um, the movement of material as, um, uh, as part of the, the current kind of um, uh, complicated um, understanding of, of um, uh, political entities, borders, and um, migration. Um, next slide, please. Even though Max von Oppenheim's particular uh, interest in uh, Tel Halaf was its archaeological remains, um, while doing research, I came across um, a series of books that Max had written uh, called Bedouins, which is a series of ethnograph ethnographic studies of uh, Bedouin tribes living in and around Tal Halaf uh, that featured genealogical trees, uh, maps of um, location in summer and winter. But more importantly, it featured um, uh, kind of daily life records of, uh, of um, uh, kind of Bedouin tribes. And one of these kind of records was that Max had this discovered that um, there's a specific type of jacket, the bisht, that the um, Bedouins can wear that can be turned into a tent uh, if uh, stranded uh, and one has to kind of create a temporary shelter. This information was actually relayed to the German military. And soon after, the German military developed a series of single soldier tents that were adapted from the design of this bisht. Um, soon after, the French, the Russian, and the US army uh, adapted the same design. And so over the, the course of the multiple offenses around the region, this um, 
a type of single soldier tents has been used uh, in uh, kind of in our part of the world. And I was really kind of interested in the slippery in the slippery slope between ethnographic studies and military interventions. And so in this uh, installation called Exquisite Corpse, which is also on view at the Sharjah Art Foundation, you have seven types of these um, single soldier tents. Um, next slide, please. Um, that kind of uh, turn the kind of the tent, the skin of the tents into these kind of curtains that divide the space. And all along the back wall, you have all the other components uh, of these tents. So the stakes, the ropes, all the elements and a moment kind of of a disembodiment. Uh, Next slide, please. And more importantly, what's presented in the piece uh, is also the uh, original maps and genealogical trees that, that uh, Max von Oppenheim drew of the migration patterns of Bedouin tribes. And for me, it was really uh, a really interesting kind of uh, document to come across because it was it what it is one that considers uh, borders as second like current political uh, I mean political uh, borders and entities as secondary to a way of looking at um, at this territory and where kind of migration patterns between summer and winter leads the leads the conversation. Um, next slide, please. Um, oh, and. Uh, during the kind of my research, even though the project was focused on uh, Max von Oppenheim and his dig, I was always very curious about what was my great grandfather doing uh, uh, in Tel Halaf with Max von Oppenheim. And this is when I learned that he had been assigned by the authorities of the French mandate to uh, spend six months with Max von Oppenheim in 1929 and kind of like shadow him as a translator and secretary because my great grandfather had worked as a translator for the uh, under the uh, the authorities of the French mandate, and uh, so while um, next slide please while working on his uh, on I'm sorry on that uh, dig, uh, my great grandfather had kept a diary of his movement throughout the uh, throughout these six months and everything that he did with with Max von Oppenheim. At the end of this um, six months period, the diary was actually confiscated by Max von Oppenheim and remained in his archive until in 2016, I was uh, given access to it by the Max von Oppenheim Foundation in Cologne. Um, next slide, next slide, please. And when I actually uh, got access to this um, a diary, uh, I found out it's about, you know, 300 pages long, and it is a, uh, it contained all the interviews that my great grandfather had done with uh, Bedouin elders, um, talking about not only migration patterns and issues of kinship, but also location of bodies of water, size of cattle, uh, ideas around fauna and flora. And that's when I realized that a lot of this material had actually been the material used in order for Max to write uh, the book that he did. So for this new commission work that was done specifically for Sharjah, um, I combined what was left in my family's uh, archive, these few photographs and book um, with uh, this diary to create a chronology uh, that kind of moves the viewer from 1929 in March when my great grandfather signed the contract uh, to be Max von Oppenheim's secretary, all the way to 2016, when I was um, given access uh, to this to this material. Um, next slide, please. Uh, um, next slide, please. And maybe the 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 maybe the most personal aspect of this uh, work has been um, at the end of his um, involvement in the expedition in 1929. My great grandfather was given a, a rug woven out of goat hair uh, by the um, Bedouin stationed in Tel Halaf. It measured one meter uh, wide by 20 meters long. Uh, in 1981, head of um, uh, 
before passing away, my great grandfather had no nothing of value to leave behind. So his will was that this rug be divided equally among his five children, uh, with the provision that every child should divide their rug amongst their children, and so on and so forth until the rug eventually disappears. As of today, this rug has been divided into 23 pieces across five generations. And so this um, kind of maybe one work has been kind of seminal for me in, in kind of relating uh, uh, this kind of personal familial story to a larger um, archeological dig. Next slide, please. And uh, throughout this project, I have been, so this project has taken many forms, like I said, depending on the institutions uh, that it has been presented in, but maybe one of the main uh, uh, component is this performance called Dear Victoria that I have performed in different settings and that uses the story of Max von Oppenheim, my great grandfather's involvement in the dig and particularly certain aspects, certain material um, uh, leftovers of this um, uh, unlikely um, a meeting uh, as a way to kind of explore uh, questions on the relationship between biography, self-directed research, um, uh, archaeological artifacts, cultural appropriation, museological practices, and migration patterns. And just very quickly, next slide, please. There's two ways in which this work has kind of lived on beyond the confines of uh, institutional walls. One is a, a catalog, a book that was um, uh, published by several institutions and Charger Art Foundation was one of the ones that co-published this, which is a trilingual publication that kind of walks uh, through the entire narrative and showcases some of the, the works uh, being uh, presented. Uh, and it's actually designed to replicate uh, identically the book that I had found when I was a child in my grandparents' uh, apartment. Next slide, please. And the new commission, which is a digital platform uh, that was commissioned for uh, this, this show, for uh, the Sharjah Art Foundation show, uh, that actually combines all the material and all the research gathered in the past five years and makes it public from uh, raw material, interviews, finished artworks, exhibitions, and it will also include the texts uh, that Omar, Uzma, and uh, Andrea have written and uh, different contributions that have happened throughout uh, this, this journey. Next slide, please. And I'm very happy that we're kind of, we were able to kind of use the, the, the Sharjah presentation as an excuse to kind of commission a work that goes beyond the confines of the wall of any institution and makes all this material, primarily the research um, public. Thank you. And now I'll leave it to Uzma. Sorry, I took uh, extra time. Oh, it was great. It was great. Thank you so much. This was such, it's such a rich, rigorous, generative show. So I want to congratulate both you, Rayan, and Ryan on Exquisite Corpse. It's been such a pleasure to work with both of you. Um, so good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Um, and to all of you joining us today, my name is Uzma Rizvi and I'm an Associate Professor of Anthropology and Urban Studies at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, New York. So I wanted to begin by thanking the organizers for the March meeting, the staff curators and all the staff. I know there's so much labor that goes into this and we're like the last one. And so you all are just like holding on. So I just wanna give you a big shout out and I wanna acknowledge and appreciate kind of all of that labor. So since we can't be together, I'd like to invite all of you to visit one of the projects that Rayan just spoke about within Exquisite Corpse. And that's the portrait of Bayek um, Borkos, right, with me. There are about two, you saw the sort of larger image that Rayan showed. Um, there are about 262 documents presented as portrait. And it's kind of interesting to think about how paperwork makes a person, right? We can think about this in terms of visa, there's so much there, right? But just to begin with, so I, you know, this brings together material from two sources. One is, as Rian mentioned, um, his family archives in Beirut, and then the Max von Oppenheim Stiftung in Cologne. There's so much to say about the bringing together, the confiscation of of knowledge, right? Um, but for the little time I have today, I thought what might be an interesting way into some of this material is to take you through a few uh, places where I paused and not so much in text, but in the visual, because I think visual is a little easier 
to kind of enter into that universe um, with me. Now I'm pausing here in this archive, not just as, you know, an individual who's interested in visuality and, and you know, certain colonial time periods, but specifically as an archeologist, right? And as, as someone who, ha who occupies and embo is embodied as a brown subject, you know? And also as one who is complicit in the spaces that maintain neo-coloniality within the structures of the academy and the museum. So I just want you know, us to be aware of all of that sort of contradictory information that we're all kind of holding within ourselves um, as, we, as we go through this. So here we have, you know, um, the first kind of, it's not the first time we see him, but it's the one of the first kind of moments where you have a full frontal moment of self-representation, right? So this is this is a moment where um, Brokosh has asked a photographer, the photographer has come to him and said, let's take a picture of the snake that you killed the day before, right? Um, and so you have, this moment where the individual himself is saying, here I am, and, and there's a certain kind of pride in the gesture with the individual standing right by. You know, um, I spent a lot of time looking at this image, um, trying to really get a sense of, of who he was. There's this kind of mischievous smile. It's kind of a sliver of a smile, but it's still quite there. Um, it's not lost on me also, you can see both the obverse and uh, the, the, the image, that it was used as a postcard, you know, and there's this beautiful, intimate, personal message for his wife and children, you know, um, and there are a few other individual portraits of, of Brokosh in these archives, but I thought if we started here, you'd get a sense of, of who he is and how these portraits function in the show and how it all kind of comes together. So in other various parallel universes, we might have met him as Victoria's husband, perhaps in another, we would have known him as the father of Joseph, Albert and Marie, maybe even in another as a survey ethnographer of the Bedouin tribes who lived in the vicinity of Tel Halaf um, as part of his work with Max von Oppenheim. We could have also been introduced to him through the offices of the French mandate being given a project in, in which Borkosh was securely placed into the body of a colonial intellectual from whom a demand of loyalty to French was being made. So there's a lot of complexity in this body um, that there's a lot that he is holding within himself that allows us to kind of uh, get a glimpse into what the many different kind of facets that I think Grand show will open up to. If we could go to the next slide and it looks in the second slide, it, you know, if you were just kind of looking at it, you may think that maybe not, not very much is happening, that it's kind of like a scene in some sense. But what's happening in the foreground, those two figures standing next to the tent, um, that's actually uh, Max von Oppenheim dictating a letter to Borkosch, who's in, um, and in the background, which is a little bit more distant, you can see all those figures standing. It looks like they're beginning to take shape of an excavation. And what I think is so remarkable about an image like this is that as compared to the images that you usually see in archaeology books, right, or in any of these kind of um, compilations of, of archival material from archaeological perspectives, you often see this, this sort of subaltern epistemic marker and then you see an excavation. But here what you're seeing is, is sort of um, a way into a memory, right? So because you kind of think about why those, why those moments are captured and kept within, within a family archive. When I looked at this, I, I, could, I could almost taste the heat Right? I could taste the grit. I could tell that there was a breeze going, you know, and I could hear the men in the background who were excavating. And so in some sense, the photographer is taking something that is, 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 is a scene of sorts, but it is also kind of embedded in, with a lot of memory. And so I just kind of wanted to highlight that kind of focus. If we can go to the next slide. Um, here you see in, in many of these um, spaces, um, one of the things that would happen is that as individuals were collecting information or maybe even collecting pay, maybe talking through um, an idea of like who's working when, you can see those who are in the operations on the table, um, and then you have a whole lot of unnamed right, unnamed people who are standing around but who are actually the ones who are doing the labor, who are doing quite a bit of the work. Um, so these images often, again, this is something very familiar to those of us who work within the world of archaeology, um, where we often either it's for, um, you know, again, as I said, it could be a pay, it could be some information gathering, etc. It could be looking at the map, it could be establishing what kind of dig was actually going to happen. Um, if we can move to the next slide. Now here is, a, is another kind of, uh, another quintessential image we often um, see, well, not an image, an experience that we have as archaeologists. So here in this image, you see six 
men facing the camera, right? And four are seated around the table and two are standing in the far left corner. And I, I can imagine that a part of the conversation taking place, and remember this is between World War I and World War II. So they might be talking about politics. They may be talking about war. They may be talking about home, right? So these are the sort of conversations that happen at the end of the day when you're sitting around with some drinks and a cigar, which is precisely what they're all doing. Um, the dust on their shoes were, was an indicator for like this idea of them sitting after a full day of work in the field. You know, um, there's a certain complexity though that um, you can see all of the bodies kind of navigating, right? In terms of the company that's assembled. So in the annotation of this photograph, it's interesting that not all the names of the men um, around the table have been, have been taken, but there's one individual who was left unnumbered and unmarked. Um, and, and those are the kind of often the, the sorts of individuals I'm, I'm also very interested in, in taking a look at. So this man is pictured standing in the corner holding what looks like another camera or another instrument. You can see him standing right next to him. I don't know if my pointer would be able to show you that. And there's a lot that one can think about saying in terms of race and um, class privilege within this image. But I think what was really curious to me, and I've kind of written about this in, in the text, were the names of those who were marked. And even though Oppenheim's actual body is, is missing, there's something about the people he's surrounding himself with that provides insight into him and his relationships with these men and, and their relationships with each other. All of them are navigating different states of in-betweenness. And it's this in-betweenness that I'm very um, curious about and, and I wanna kind of think more about. Anyhow, I'm also looking at the time. And so um, if we can go to the last image and this is the portrait of Max von Oppenheim. So here now you have this image, right? And this is a pretty stark image. Um, and we finally get to see the person who is the, who's known to be the excavator, Tal Halaf, um, as compared to everyone who's done the labor, which is where we started from, and I think very importantly so in a very post-colonial gesture. Now, one of the interesting things is on the Agra side, which is also um, shown here. Um, this was given to Burkosh during his work as secretary in 1929, right? And so it's signed on the back. You can see that signature on the, on the back. But then right under that signature, um, there's a, a sort of po two lines from a poem that was written um, by um, Ali ibn Abi Talib, right? And I'll tell you what the translation is. It's very light so that you won't be able to see it. I don't know if you can actually see it in the image here. But the translation is, an orphan is not one without a father. An orphan is one without knowledge and manners. And so these, these lines of this poem are proclaiming some sort of higher calling, like more than family, more than country is knowledge, is manners, is wisdom. Knowing how to be that makes one secure, as secure as one would be with family. That somehow in all of the, the mess of coloniality and imperialism and everything else, the ways in which one might kind of rise above and, and answer that higher calling might be through knowledge and through knowing. So one can imagine the lines from this poem to have been written on the back of the photograph received by Borjos himself. Because actually, if you look at the Arabic, it, it's very similar to the Arabic script that um, his notes are written in. So I did a little quick analysis there. Um, and so I'm thinking then of, of Borjos and, and why he, he thought it was a good idea to write those lines. Was this a poem that they both shared? Was it um, Borjos himself in hopes to remember who and what this man stood for? Um, or what he may have learned about himself through the experience, right? And so it's gestures like these in, in poetry and exhibition that provide insight into the human, into human complexity that is at once fraught and, and infinitely full of love. Right? And so with that, I'm gonna pass it on. Um, thank you. I think, um, Andrea, you're next. Yes, thank you so much, Isma. Um, <clears throat> So uh, I just wanted to actually echo um, what Usma just said about all the work that's gone on to this and um, thanking everyone um, and acknowledging kind of how it's all led up to uh, this amazing discussion um, that's, that's happened so far. Um, so I thought that I would uh, talk about this all kind of in relation to my text, um, but also kind of the conceptualization of my thinking around everything that Ryan has been exploring, um, and especially how that has been made possible through surrogates, uh, like photographic reproductions and documentation. Um, so I'll ask you to go to my first slide. Thank you. And um, also thinking about the concept and the idea of the exquisite corpse. 
which was this uh, surrealist parlor game that began with a piece of paper that was folded into horizontal sections. So the first player would draw the section at the top and leave just a little bit below the line before folding it back and then passing it on to the next player. And of course, there's four pieces of paper there going on at the same time. Um, but what ends up happening is each player produces a different segment of the work. And when it is unfolded, we have an exquisite corpse, um, but we also have these kind of unique and identifiable layers. So we can see something surreal, but also very um, identifiable and distinguishable at the same time. So, you know, for our purposes, I've been really thinking about, you know, the game as a way to frame the creative process, but also how we encounter this work, because actually what we're also looking at here is a surrogate, right? It's a reproduction of this work that's been used or made using digital technology rather than the actual work itself. And uh, we can't separate the surrogate from the fact, you know, that it has been reproduced by someone else. So someone who might impact how we as viewers relate to the source and even interpret the surrogate in relation to the source. So of course, the more faithful the reproduction uh, is to the source or the more accurate we see it as being, the more likely we are as viewers to almost look through the surrogate and see the surrogate as its source. But even this way of seeing has been conditioned upon us, meaning um, the idea of reproduction being like a scientific or accurate representation of the source, along with how that directs ideas of authenticity and what it is that we're actually reproducing in the process, or even how we experience the work because we see it as removed from the wider context through which it was produced or reproduced or disseminated. Um, so if I can go to the next slide, please. So I wanted to tease this out using just one of Rand's sources that he explores in Exquisite Corpse. And um, that's specifically the gravestone that was used to mark someone's tomb around 10th to 9th uh, century BCE until it was excavated and removed from serving that purpose uh, in 1912. Um, so what we're looking at here is actually a digital surrogate of the source that itself has gone through an exquisite uh, corpse process. And um, we're looking at, you know, the, the most recent layer, which is the end result of this process to date. And through it, we might wonder how it came to be in this version and who has been responsible or central to that. And as part of this inquiry, we might ask, you know, what folds or moments altered this work and created the conditions uh, for this gravestone to be as it appears to us now. Um, so I really wanted to explore how we kind of chart what happened within those periods um, and those folds to kind of better understand how we encounter the gravestone, um, as well as its history through the many, many surrogates that have been produced as it has existed in each version during those periods. And also surrogates of what? Because the source itself has been fragmented and has been reconstructed across these folds. And some of those surrogates are now truer to the source than the work that we see here before us. And so to do that, you know, we not only have to kind of think about and uncover what is known, but also what is not known. And the gaps and uncertainties that have impacted the source today and which leave space for interpretation within this chronology, um, as well as thinking about the narrative and knowledge production that become uh, replicated through conditions of power and access that circulate around the work. So to illustrate all of this, you know, and how Tibet's uh, own, Rand's own work contributes kind of new layers when we're thinking about how these folds become visible and the histories and the context, um, I just wanted to quickly take you through the chronology, uh, beginning with, you know, the first fold, which was in 1899 and using the surrogates and the digital surrogates, which, you know, have comprised this entire uh, um, presentation um, that are produced across these folds. Um, so if I could go to the next slide. So the first fold um, occurred with the uncovering of Tel Halaf, and um, more than a decade later, this image was captured um, of the moment when the source was removed from serving its purpose of marking the grave. And this was noted by von Oppenheim as taking days to unearth of what he referred to as a great enthroned goddess, or in this period, what I refer to as a seated figure, um, because it is an androgynous figure that um, over time has been uh, gendered in terms of the goddess of the Venus. So von Oppenheim, you know, he invested heavily in the extensive reproduction and documentation of the dig over the two years of the first official excavation, um, which he did with a permit from the Ottoman authorities. 
Um, but he also made casts of the works, one of which is thought to have accompanied him back to Germany in 1913 um, and later joined the Mar Marburg Religious History Museum in 1932. Um, so, of course, while in Germany, he was prevented from returning because of the outbreak of World War I. And during that time, the site lay abandoned. So when he returned in 1927, he found that the facial features of the work had actually been destroyed. And um, if we could go to the next slide. To the next slide, please. Um, so, and then again to the next slide, sorry. Thank you. So during this time when the site lay um, uncovered, seated figure actually became disfigured and was referred to as seated figure disfigured in, in the text. Um, and next slide as well. So throughout this period, more documentation you know, was produced, especially some of the new casts, which then were divided up um, by the French mandate and the authorities with potentially a cast of seated figure or potentially seated figure disfigured going to form the basis of the National Museum in Aleppo. So there are various versions of the surrogate that exist out there, both in photographic, but also actual material and plaster form. Um, so next slide, please. So the second fold, of course, occurs when the finds are removed from the context of Tahalaf and brought to Germany in 1929 um, to form the basis of a new museum called the Tahalaf Museum. And um, using the 1912 cast, which actually uh, was still uh, within um, uh, von Oppenheim's possession, the facial features were restored in plaster. So uh, we can see here he's standing in front of the, gave, the gravestone, which was placed at the entrance of the museum and referred to as the enthroned goddess, or what he referred to as his Venus, or his staff called her his bride, um, but right in the entrance of the museum. And it sat there for just over a decade before, and if we go to the next slide, um, the third fold occurred with the Allied bombing of Berlin. And so because the Telhalaf Museum was hit and as Rayanne explained, everything that was not basalt was destroyed. And then because of the heat, when the firefighters uh, arrived and the water doused the area, um, what was basalt exploded. And um, in the following months, those fragments were collected and then removed to the storerooms of the Pergamon Museum. So seated figure reconstructed becomes a collection of fragments and even the plaster of um, the reconstructed features are lost in the fire as well. So next slide, please. Um, and we know that von Oppenheim had always hoped that the finds would be restored, but he actually died just two years later in West Germany after the fragmentation of Germany itself. So the basalt fragment sat in the Parganon Museum in the, in the storerooms um, in East Germany. And his own grave was actually marked with a reproduction of the lower half of seated figure uh, with an inscription talking about his life and his um, expedition to Telhalaf. Next slide, please. So following German reunification, we have the fourth fold, which then allows these fragments to kind of come together and the reconstruction to begin. And by this point, because cracking had, occur had occurred over the years as well during storage, um, we're up to around 27,000 fragments that are in the museum storerooms. And so as you can see with the surrogate on the left, um, a cast of the 1912 cast is straight in the middle. And this is the one that came from the Marburg collection, which was made in position to guide the work uh, that was going on around it. And then on the right, we can see that restorers also use surrogates from von Oppenheim's surviving photographic archives, along with the various field notes and documentation that were taken around the digs and even redrawn to replace those that were lost in the fires because of the research um, that was also housed at the museum afterward. Next slide, please. So the restorers actually made decisions to leave the cracks exposed, but to fully restore the facial features with the plaster cast made from the molds of the 1912 cast. So the 1912 cast becomes a source um, in many ways for reproducing different aspects and reconstructing seated figure um, to seated figure re-reconstructed. Um, next slide, please. All of this then culminates in the 2011 exhibition of the rescued gods of the Palace of Tahalaf, which displayed seated figure re-reconstructed, as well as the remaining 2,000 basalt shards that could not be reunited with their sources. Um, so in addition, there were large format uh, photographic reproductions that were displayed throughout the exhibition. And on the very last day, those were auctioned off um, to support additional restoration um, over the coming years. 
So in addition to this exhibition, seated figure we reconstructed and the other Tahalaf artifacts then went on a world tour and um, began appearing in exhibition catalogs and websites um, in institutions in London, museum, Bonn, uh, as well as others. Um, next slide, please. So the most recent fold occurs when Rayan meets with the curators and the restorers to discuss his grandfather's connections to the artifacts during the residency in Berlin, um, which sets off everything in motion to you know, what we're even discussing today. Um, so as Rayan said, he was you know, given options for how to kind of work with the materials and make surrogates, one of which was charcoal rubbing. There was also photography and 3D scanning, um, but he chose foil pressings and rubbings because of their methods of reproductions that are still used today, but also that allowed them to gauge with the uh, materiality of the work. Um, and in the same rooms where the source was reconstructed, um, you know, he reproduced the anthropomorphic figures of a seated figure using the cast of the 1912 cast, as well as making a thousand charcoal rubbings uh, from the remaining 2000 basalt shards. Um, and in doing so, of course, he's systematically documenting the process and the conditions of the work um, with, you can see seated figure sit right in front of him. Next slide, please. So I started to really think about um, Brianne's methodology as very much a reproduction of the conditions around the source, as well as the layers, the histories, the narratives, and the materiality, um, including the paths that were taken by the various components that started in different places and came together and are still uh, kind of reconstructing and moving in different places as well as opposed to the story of the Tahalaf works, which started in one place and then were disseminated after the removal. Next slide, please. Um, but in doing this research through surrogates and especially relying so much on the images to kind of piece together the histories and the documentation and, and um, even the, on the chronology of this, um, decided to chart this with a graph that really documents the folds in the stories but also the realities of trying to undertake such a mapping or charting and doing that through surrogates uh, and thinking about what is not included just as being as important about what is, but especially because we focus on what we know to be in existence as being representative of the narrative. Um, so the surrogate that we use for that can obscure just as, as much as it reveals. Um, but the, you know, even thinking about this as the story beginning, you know, well before we became to encounter it, and it will continue to go on afterwards, um, and more folds will, of course, continue uh, in the time going forward, um, because the basalt itself existed for millions of years before it was excavated and carved into a gravestone, and then again for two millennia before it was excavated and removed from Tahulaf. And so the gravestone as a source and even its materiality has um, changed, been deconstructed and reconstructed over the years, depending on you know, the agents or the players of this game who have impacted it, as well as those who were granted access to reproduce it. And thinking about how these reproductions themselves, these surrogates, can now travel further than their sources through digital technologies and even across borders in ways that the material sources would be unable. Um, and of course, everything that we have seen today and is part of the presentation is a digital surrogate in some form, um, but they often have layers of reproduction contained in them or layers of surrogacy through the various forms of reproduction that um, they under, undergo before they're presented to us in digital form. So the people who are responsible for making them and who have had possession of the sources or even produced and protected the surrogates through copyright um, impact how we encounter the work and the knowledge around it and how we understand it today. So this chart is meant to be an unfolding of this relationship, but also thinking back to this source as um, producing a flawed family tree of, out of offshoots um, that can only be tracked and understood in relation to each other if they exist uh, and exist online. But this chart also demonstrates you know, the exquisite corpse process, because if we think about this as both a chronology and an ontology, um, we have a chronology of surrogates that are produced in a space between these folds um, and by whom or because of whom becomes an interesting question in the very relative short tiny period of time that we're talking about in relation to the gravestone itself. Um, but it also includes Tibet's works as surrogates within this chronology because his works are reproductions that actually reveal layers of the exquisite corpse and the surrogates themselves in terms of what has happened to the source before it came to be before him. 
um, but also through their creation and the rematerialization of the histories and the intangible knowledge or aspects of the works. And what we're thinking about um, in relation to those sources, which is still very much ongoing. So that point, I'm gonna pass off to Omar. <laughs> Thank you very much, yeah. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me and for this uh, really wonderful opportunity to be part of uh, uh, Rayan's work and be part of the Sharjah uh, uh, experience. And thanks for this panel and appreciate all the work that has been done in putting all of this together. Um, so uh, my name is Omar Dewachi. I'm uh, both a, I'm trained as a physician and an anthropologist. Uh, so I've been kind of working at the border of medicine and anthropology, not really necessarily, uh, I don't work around questions of art, but, I, but, but I'll give you a little bit of a, um, of a, of a background of how, the, the, of the process of writing the essay, but also the kind of how the work of Rayan inspired certain kind of experiences. Um, so for the past decades, I've been mainly documenting experiences of war and displacement across uh, the region. Um, and in my work, I have mainly focused on the idea or the analytic of what I call the wound uh, as a way to speak about history, as a way to speak about social relations, speak about physical and mental uh, trauma but also to think about how that wound is uh, refracted in everyday experiences of, the, uh, of, of, of people's life, especially those who, get dis who lose their homes dis or get displaced across the world. So, so when I was approached uh, to write something, I, I, I was a little bit struggling with that because uh, I didn't know which part of the work that, that uh, I wanted to uh, speak to. But one of the things that uh, inspired me is the connection between the personal uh, stories and the broader kind of uh, both intellectual and aesthetic uh, elements of, of this work. And in the spirit of the idea that art uh, stimulates a certain kind of aesthetic experience, I ended up really writing a personal essay um, uh, that, that kind of through its own threads tied a lot of the themes uh, that I felt uh, were running in Rayan's work. Um, so, so uh, I mean, when I, when I began to see the work, I, it really kind of instigated uh, different themes of thought, emotions, and I felt like this was uh, really um, a very productive and a fruitful way to begin to think about this. What it was interesting that there was a, there was a, there was a, it's a historical, there's a lot of, his, it's a historical event or there's a historical process, but it also spoke in many ways to the present, uh, the present of a region that has been experiencing a massive loss. Uh, you know, I'm thinking here, of course, of the violence in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, the destruction of cities, the destruction of artifacts, uh, and of course, the displacements of populations. So, so for me, this is the, uh, the, the work of Rayan uh, brought a lot of these uh, threads all together uh, uh, through looking at, at a kind of a genealogy of, of this region um, through looking at these um, uh, archeological digs and the stories of the material story, the human story that kind of brought, were kind of tied into this, uh, to this work. So for me, there was definitely a political story there. There was a pop, there was a, a population history. Uh, there is a, re, a history of the region, but that that region is not seen only from a kind of a, a local perspective. It's seen through a very a, for movement of these different fragments across borders, um, and in, and in turn, there is a material history. Uh, and and what was really fascinating for me is the also the personal history. Uh, of uh, Rayan himself, uh, the relationship of his grandfather to the story, and of course, uh, the the important elements that connected that past to the present. Um, that so for me that the, the work was able to distill uh, a range of thematics: uh, a journey of loss, fragmentation, displacement, and repair. 
Um, so I was inspired by these different facets of this work. And, and one of the things that I spoke with Rayan about and with Ryan is uh, this, uh, this uh, tension that we have in Arabic. We say al-bashar wal-hajar, al-ilaqa bain al-bashar wal-hajar, the relationship between stone and the, uh, humans or people in general. And what I wanted to uh, do in, uh, in, in the essay or in reflecting on the work is uh, kind of uh, move between that kind of material and human history and blur it in many ways uh, in, in, uh, uh, in that relationship that, uh, uh, that I feel the work does very, very well. Um, so, uh, so the questions that I had, what does it mean to experience loss? And specifically, we're talking about a whole region uh, the story of um, the colonial history here of uh, taking away uh, certain kind of the the the, uh, the kind of the the treasures as, as or the demons and the gods of the region. What does it mean really to take o to take away these uh, 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 that that image these imageries or these artifacts from the region and the movement also of people and the fragmentation of these kind of artifacts and then the attempts of trying to repair them back and how can this stands as a for, as a metaphor and a metonym uh, for the experiences of loss and uh, repair for everyday life so so uh, so I began actually writing in a form of a stream of consciousness and I, I, w I didn't really know what to do with these uh, kind of very angry, uh, very um, uh, stream of consciousness kind of uh, uh, images that, I, that inst were instigated by the work. And uh, eventually I, I began relating a lot of this to my own uh, kind of experiences of loss. Of course, I mean, you can read the essay uh, I speak in the essay about a, uh, a rug that I've uh, carried with me through all my own displacement and my ambivalence relationship to, to this rug throughout all these years. Um, and of course, one of the things that, that, uh, that spoke to that experience is uh, uh, Faak Burkhosh's uh, uh, incredible idea to, uh, to, take, uh, to take this this rug that he got from uh, the the dig or from the his, his encounters with the with the Bedouins in in uh, Syria, and and try to kind of divide uh, or move it through his own genealogy through kind of his own kids and grandkids, and the the journey that this intergenerational uh, rug has has uh, has has taken on was was very interesting for me and uh, not necessarily here. A, a rug that gets divided into the family, but a rug that becomes the remains of 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 my own kind of home and my own uh, kind of experiences of loss that I carry with me. That I have a lot of difficulties in um, in kind of keeping and not really knowing what to do with it. Uh, so uh, so for me the 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 this was this was a, 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 a an incredible story of this idea of the afterlife of the fragments so the questions that i would like to maybe end with because i want to also kind of have more time for the discussion is uh, how do we really uh, carry on these wounds with us uh, wounds of the places that we grew up in the wounds that kind of uh, continue to haunt us in the everyday and what kind of work of repair that we do uh, to be able to um, uh, not necessarily to forget, but to actually be um, uh, to 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 feel more comfortable with our present. So uh, so basically, I'll I'll end here. Uh, and uh, I again thank you so much for this opportunity. And uh, I'm very honored and uh, I feel very privileged to be part of this process. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Ryan, Uzma, and Jan Omar for your for your presentations um, and for covering so much ground so quickly. Um, I think I just want to ask you guys one kind of one question to kind of try to create a through line through these different presentations, and specifically, you know, kind of taking this um, what Ryan has given us in fragments, not only in the work but also kind of just through that language and to kind of think about how it points us to not only the pieces that are part of a whole, but the, the gaps in between elements, right? So I think one of the first things that 
really uh, excited me about the project was um, the kind of focus or what I what I kind of projected into the work. It was this sort of interest in an, interme an intermediary figure or a concept or analytical space in Omar's case that really um, allowed me to kind of unfold the work in all these different ways. So they just thought really spoke to a present that that I wanted to respond to. And in particular, I think, um, I think, you know, as a curator also to kind of implicate myself in the, into this conversation, like to kind of think about like where the critical space of art was. And I think, you know, like I, when I approached Ryan's project, I was like, oh my God, this is a project. It's a solo, we've organized a solo show um, of a project called Fragments that we've kind of tried to populate with all these other people, ideas, um, kind of energies. And I think paying attention to this intermediary is really kind of essential. And so I kind of wanted to kind of pose this question to you to think about how maybe you move through that in relation to Ryan's work or how that is also reflected in kind of the work in your, your own fields and kind of your own, your own personal work as well. I don't know who wants to, Uzma, I think maybe you can start because I think it's really, it's in your text, it's, it's you know, it's in kind of Fayek and also in your reading of, of Max and the group that he's, he's mm -hmm. assembled. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that question. I think this is what I was referring to when I was thinking of the complicity of the body, right? And so um, the ways in which, I mean, there are a couple things here in your question, Ryan, that I, I kind of want to pull through. And, and one of them is, is the spaces in between Right, so um, the stuff that's left out. So it's fragments. So there are things that we're pulling together. Um, we're in the archive, or we're looking at, um, like as Andrea showed us, all those timelines and the different folds. Right, but what is missing is just as significant as as what is there. Right, and I think uh, one of the beautiful things about uh, Rayan's work is that it allows us to imagine so many different possibilities. It's so generative in that way. Right, so those spaces in between aren't spaces that lack. They're in, in fact spaces that are incredibly full. So within that framework to then think about the individuals here, and here we can think of, you know, Borkosh himself, we can think of Oppenheim, you know, these were all men of in between. And this is kind of one of the things that I was exploring a bit in my, in my text, like what does it mean to have, um, so for example, right, um, Oppenheim was, there's a, there's a whole book written by Gosman about the passion of, of Max von Oppenheim. And in that, one of the key things that's happening is that there's a very strong, as you can imagine, anti-Semitic um, sort of current that is going through Germany um, between World War I and World War II. And Max's family is actually, has converted to Christianity many generations before, but their last name is still Oppenheim. So, so much of Oppenheim's work and because he's an amateur archaeologist and not a professional archaeologist, so much of his work, when you read his texts and when you read the letters and his archive, Oppenheim's archive, he's navigating the spaces in between to be recognized as a full, right? And it's interesting that then when he works with, um, you know, these various men who come in as architects, as photographers, they all seem to be occupying these spaces in between. Right, and, and it's those spaces in between that I think are so interesting as, as, um, as individuals, as people. So for example, I'm simultaneously in my body as an archeologist following through in a very colonial fashion, right? But because the body of the archeologist is also female, is also a brown body, it's, it's, it's different. But the complicity part I think is important. That's what brings it to the present. What does it mean for us to be complicit in these structures such as museums, right? that maintain colonial narratives, that maintain exclusion, that maintain um, the ways in which materials and people's lives or, or individuals are, are known or understood. What does it mean for us to continue to stay in those spaces and also do critique, right? Like how do we, and I think that's what makes it contemporary. That's precisely that, that node. And, and I'll, I'll, I wanna make sure to like hear from everyone else, but that's kind of my, my take on that. Thanks, Isma. Andrea, do you want to take a crack at that? Or yeah, no, I um, I would very, I would agree, and I would actually even build on that. Uh, 
when thinking about the purpose of reproduction and as the surrogate as being kind of like uh, an agent or an interlocutor for disseminating knowledge and allowing people to kind of engage with the source. Um, and so the way that that is materialized then becomes very important in terms of what we understand the work to be, what we understand the source to be, and then how that filters how we kind of produce knowledge around it. And so, for example, when you look at so much uh, kind of scientific, accurate um, approaches to reproduction that end up producing like a specimen, like a, a photograph, a two-dimensional or 3D uh, photograph that is as accurate as modern technologies can allow us to do um, with the work, that is apparently, you know, the highest regard and the best form for us to be thinking about the source work and its relation to a period of time or the story that, you know, in the context around it. Um, but at the same time, so much of Rayanne's work, you know, is a form of reproduction and it produces a surrogate that is so detached from that idea of like scientific specimen reproduction and accuracy in a sense that um, really conveys all of the meanings that get lost when we focused on this kind of very aesthetic form of reproduction um, that is so much truer to all of the intangible aspects of the work um, and so much of what Usma was talking about um, in a way that, you know, becomes a much better vehicle for understanding um, and even encountering the work and the source and all of the people who have um, been so influential uh, in, in where the actual work we're discussing is located and, and owned um, today. Um, so I think, you know, part of that focus on the gaps on, um, you know, ideas around regeneration and um, interpretation by focusing on the space that we don't know or the fragments or even, you know, the moments of destruction and those folds then becomes a really interesting lens for thinking about everything that, you know, is being replicated over and over, over here in a way that is uncritical. Yeah, Omar, I'm wondering if I can kind of pose this question to you and ask you to kind of dig into this this text that you've written on, you know, called When Wounds Travel and was kind of like really, I think, important to us in terms of bringing the body into the picture, but not, you know, a kind of individual body, but the kind of, you know, space between bodies or um, this thing that kind of binds bodies together, but is not located in any single, you know, person. Right. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, I, I'll try to kind of start with the fragment and then kind of move to that question. Um, so one of the things that I actually uh, think a lot about it, as, as as someone who's trying to understand social life or, you know, everyday life or and, 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 and kind of writing also uh, in in the blurriness of of the the kind of the biosocial you know, because there are these kind of biological or material elements and then the kind of a, a certain kind of sense of, of, of social relations and ideas and, and uh, symbolic imaginaries, you know, all of that. Um, that the starting point of thinking about the world or at least how we receive the world or how we experience the world is a, a fragmented kind of experience in many ways. And, and at least from a very phenomenological or even psychoanalytical perspective, that is your starting point, that there is a fragment and then you are trying to kind of make sense of these fragments throughout your experience. Um, so, so for me, that's why the wound was a very useful uh, uh, category uh, for analysis, uh, mainly because it, it, it does not assume a hole, it assumes a fissure or assumes a kind of a break uh, in the in the body it assumes a break in the hole and and that is the starting point of thinking about uh, many aspects you know including social relations including um, uh, you know physical bodies including relationship with with, with material including uh, relationship between people relationship with history so so I would I would really uh, uh, and, and, and thinking about it, I mean, in that essay that you've you've just uh, mentioned, uh, I spoke about about uh, the uh, 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 an experience of an Iraqi who got tortured and in Iraq and then managed to get displaced to Beirut. Uh, and in Beirut, he was he was dealing with all this kind of trauma diagnosis and 
and, uh, and dealing with institutions. And what I wanted to do in this essay, or at least to show how relations, human relations, uh, is, uh, uh, you know, in many ways are defined and redefined through this notion of the wound. Uh, the idea that 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 when we meet, when when you uh, recognize a wound, you become empathetic to it. You know, you see someone who is wounded, or uh, uh, you become empathetic. But also, if we look at like the current moment of identity crises and identity politics, you begin to see that that becomes also a certain kind of a wound, where people begin to uh, kind of really race uh, of whose wound is more valuable whose wound is more worthy of of uh, of uh, uh, you know victimhood so so there is that tension i feel uh, that is uh, fascinating to to work with um and so 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 the this was a kind of you know like a more of a broader idea of of this essay and the traveling element of that wound also opens up the the um, uh, the both the temporalities and the uh, emplacement or displacement element of 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 human relations here. Um, so so in in many ways, I feel like the work that Ryan was doing is very much speaking to these kind of questions uh, through looking at how this material moving across borders through looking at at what happens when uh, these the, this hall becomes fragments and the, the fragments now becomes more uh, you know in terms of uh, it is more in, in, in it's an excess to the whole you know they try to put all these things together but there are parts that don't have a home anymore so 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 there's something very useful to think with in terms of the success of these uh, fragments um to and and it opens up that conversation that there's always something partial there's always a, a, a situated form of of knowledge that we can we can reflect on uh, but it also reflect a, a different kind of uh, level of human relations. And that's kind of maybe what you're trying to look at, is that, that many people uh, uh, relate to each other through certain kind of notion of woundedness. In Arabic, we have the jurh, uh, the wound is, is something that exists in, in, in music, exists in, uh, in, uh, in poetry, exists in our stories, and it exists in, in, in the kind of sense of despair that many of us have been experiencing uh, in relationship to places that we grew up in and, and relate to. So, so I think capturing that as a way to, uh, 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 as a lens into connecting us with this historical, um, the historical events, and I, I would say historical wound or a social wound, uh, that, that is, I feel like it would be very productive to think with in general. Thanks, Samar. Um, I was told we have 15 more minutes, so we can kind of shift towards the question. I do want to kind of pose this question and to Ryan, but kind of through a question um, from the audience by Joy Chansey, who says, how does this project intersect with calls for art and cultural heritage restitution? And I thought I could kind of add to that, you know, I, I'm wondering, Ryan, if you could maybe talk about how you initially approached some of these institutions to gain access to the artifacts because i think that also kind of shows a sort of multifaceted like the kind of all that all the different hats that you were kind of wearing at the time to kind of navigate really kind of deftly you know um kind of perceived um you know restrictions or you know to to the work yeah i mean <clears throat> one of the things i was you know i always um talk about when when I'm in a context presenting fragments is this anecdote that uh, whenever I approach somebody to collaborate with them on this project, whether it is somebody who works in an, what we call an encyclopedic museum or a contemporary art space or a writer, I always kind of tell them, you know, I'm the great grandson of um, this translator who worked on a dig uh, in, you know, 1929. And I have some material that I just like to share and show you and then just talk to you about. And so I, uh, and that has particularly with uh, encyclopedic museums 
have led to most of the curators or conservators letting some of their guard down, as opposed to me approaching them like I'm a Lebanese artist based, you know, between Beirut and New York, and I'm interested in like intervening in your collection. Um, and and it, like I did this fully aware that it is a form of entrapment for both of us because it's involving myself personally in the story, so I could never remove myself from it. But it was also a way to kind of like in the woundedness, like to kind of approach it from a, let's say, first person angle in order to get to the third person. From the beginning, I always, you know, the I'm not, not interested in just like the, I think the story of my great grandfather and his involvement in the dig is not the end of this um, uh, journey. It is a trigger for a potential beginning, but it's the beginning for a journey that I'm not always certain where it will lead. So being able to being open for it to kind of go any which way, some institutions just refuse to even like have that first meeting. Other institutions were like, okay, come and make these copies and then just go on your merry way. And some are like, okay, let's make a show. Let's transform the, how we think about this work and this place. So it's really important to, to realize, and particularly maybe that's, um, uh, to, to, to realize the position that particularly artists can occupy or operate in that is kind of like a double like a double agent in a way and where and when to kind of activate these these kind of moments and particularly I mean if we if I were to address the the question about you know sentiments of restitution, uh, repatriation. Uh, for me, the, the example of Tel Halaf was such an interesting and operative example because it was it operated in two ways. Uh, one, uh, like I said, these most of the bulk of the material from Tel Halaf was destroyed in Berlin. That's a historical fact. This is not and in a way in the in the continuum of the story, these ob the objects that were left in Aleppo were actually the ones that um, are kept safe. Um, I was I was interested in that contradiction, but particularly in the case of some of the objects that ended in uh, encyclopedic museums, particularly the ones that ended at the Walters Museum in Baltimore and at the Metropolitan Museum in New York, uh, because they were bought under the aegis of the Alien Property Custodian Act, they were a requisition from a German national, right? Because it, they uh, the 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 office. Of of the alien property custodian identified Max von Oppenheim as the rightful owner of this object, whether this is ethically correct or not, but like the paperwork showed that. And this is why in my uh, show, show currently on view at the Metropolitan Museum called Alien Property. There was this, a decision on behalf of Kim Benzel, the curator in charge of Ancient Near East, Claire Davies, curator in Modern Contemporary, and myself to actually showcase one of the for the one of the first time in the history of the Met the acquisition documents to say that should there ever be a restitution claim, the object will actually be returned to Germany. Because in the current state of this story, the the um, uh, the ownership is still German, and so it complicates these uh, these notions. And one of the ways, uh, so similarly to how I was introduced to Omar through this essay, Wounds That Travel, the way I was introduced actually to Andrea's work was through her um, response to the Sar Savoir report, which is a call for repatriation, restitution for African objects back from, from France. And one of the ways I was really moved or I was introduced to this idea of digital repatriation or what happens to an object where okay, imagine we return an object, what happens to its surrogates? And if today we have a system where still, let's say, Western entities hold the rights for digital reproductions, for the, um, have the tools to digitize collections and they keep the rights for those, even if the objects were to be returned physically, they're um, replica being still held in these institutions is a new form of colonization. So it helped me, I uh, expand rather than like take um, a, a clear cut position, expand the question that if you just look at one object from one dig, it already opens up this 
um, myriad of, of really complex, often contradictory um, set of questions that we need to address in details in order to help us move forward. I think this, this what I've learned in the past five years is really the specificity of those um, uh, questions and how do we, through addressing specific questions, actually have a, have a um, uh, get sorry to a to a um, a general approach to questions of safety and uh, repatriation. A Andrea, I'm wondering, do you want to add something to that since you were just quoted by Ryan? Yeah, I think um, you know, I mean, there's so many places I could have taken this text, and I kind of had to like stop myself from going in seven different directions. Um, one of which was very related to this idea of because the digital surrogates exist in so many places and even the material surrogates themselves, um, possession of the surrogates then results in a form of power uh, and narrative control and even claiming copyright in it or uh, barriers to physical access. Um, can recreate a lot of uh, the colonial power systems that resulted in possession of the work wherever that work is um, at that place in time. But also the, you know, the very process of like reproducing it from material to digital then creates potentially a new copyright. Um, and that copyright becomes something that can be commercialized and um, you can use to prevent people from using the work or even to waive it in a way um, that would allow people to use it, maybe not as it should be used or intended. And kind of thinking about working backwards um, around do we digitize? What are the, you know, the reasons around doing this and who should be making that decision? Um, so I think there's some, you know, some really important questions we need to ask about the digital in relation to the material. And especially when it comes to repatriation about it being a withdrawal of power overall. And if there are surrogates that are retained, um, all of those are retained with the consent of the communities of origin and even having um, ideas of care around um, that material that go beyond what copyright uh, would recognize. Thanks, thanks for that. Uh, we have another question uh, from Murtaza Valley. He poses this to Ryan or anyone else on the panel. Um, he's asking if uh, you can speak about the relationship between provenance and genealogy or, or and appropriated cultural objects and inherited heirlooms. Yeah, thanks, Morteza, for that. Um, it, you know, what part of working in on this project, I've been um, um, kind of fortunate enough to spend some time in the world of like, you know, archaeologists, but also kind of like museum curators in like ancient Near East. Uh, and this idea of, uh, yeah, when I kind of uh, was introduced to like the logic of provenance and how kind of it's been, uh, and I always, you know, I I have this thing that I do now that I go to like these museums and I just read their provenance of like random, I just pull a random object and I read its provenance. And if you actually just read the provenance and not look at an object, it can actually come across as like both a very accurate description of the 20th and 21st century, I mean, 19th to 21st century, but it also reads as a re in terms of like ownership, hands passing, but also it reads like a kind of a these beautiful, strange concrete poems. Um, and similarly, the question of genealogy, establishing a relationship to a time, a space and people that you might not have a relationship to per se, uh, but that you are bound to them, whether you like it or not, is um, I think what I, what, what I feel genealogy and, and provenance share is maybe the question of burden and the decision of how to carry that burden uh, is, is, is then how we move beyond the the moment of being burdened. I think that, uh, and, and I think ultimately like the moment of liberation 
comes in relationship with how we deal with this. It is a fact that currently every institution, whether an encyclopedic museum or a smaller you know, regional museum, uh, carries the burden of all the things they have to take care of. Similarly, we all carry the burden of our family histories. And so how do we kind of move with what we have? Now, in terms of like cultural appropriation, I um, maybe the, 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 and that actually is maybe related to the question on genealogy. When I kind of came across the Bedouin books that, that Max von Oppenheim had authored and all these genealogical trees that he had so kind of, you know, detailed um, drawn, uh, I kind of felt ambivalent about these projects, uh, th these books, like, why is he writing this history? Who's, you know, like kind of these questions. But at the same time, when I came across, it is still considered one of the most kind of accurate uh, and at least uh, printed uh, records of this. So the ambivalence, again, of ethnographic work, anthropological work, and the position that it takes as both kind of, um, uh, yeah, that's, that's contradictory. But it's only when I figured out the story of the, the, the jacket that's literally appropriated by the military that, I, that it, it all entered a much more, for lack of a better word, perverse space, where it kind of, in a very strange reversal of, of, of logic, it's as if we gave them the tools for our own subjugation. You know, it's this kind of crazy moment of, of recognition and, and reversal that, that has also led me to, you know, before like genealogy was personal, provenance was, uh, you know, was subjective, provenance was objective. And working on this project over the past years, I've realized the conflicted, the intertwined nature of, of those nomenclatures and those positions that I can no longer separate myself from that tent you know, from that military tent and that, and that part, like recognizing my own self in the thing that's um, exerting intense power um, over me. I don't know if that, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a perfect place to end. We're also out of time, unfortunately. Um, thank you so much, uh, Omar, Andrea, Ryan, Uzma, for spending this time with us and for your contributions and for everyone out there, look out for the publication that will be out soon. Um, thank you and, and good night. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you.